quick highlight of our program for today so that we know the roadmap going forward. Next up, we will have Mr. Dominic Brown from AIDC, the Alternative Information and Development Center. We will then break very shortly for tea, whereupon advocate Frances Hobden will then continue with leading her evidence. And Mr. Ben Theron, the CEO of Outer Organization Undoing Tax Abuse, will be taking the floor. After lunch, Ms. Zukiswa Fokazi from the Unite Behind campaign will provide us with further, further insight on state capture as well as PRASA. Mr. Zaki Ahmed will then follow Ms. Fokazi, continuing with that evidence, which will still be led by Advocate Hopton. Finally, the last event of the day in terms of speakers will be Bishop Mpulwana. We, we do have a short video from him by means of which he will be addressing us for a short moment. And then just to flag for our members who are here, as well as all of our guests, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., Saha, the South African History Archive, will be presenting an exhibition through the exhibition hall on, the, on my left-hand side of this building, titled The People Against Corruption, and snacks will be available until we do have a moment to receive the preliminary findings from the members of our panel. Until then, I now hand over to Mr. Dominic. Thank you so much. Mandla. Mandla. Forward to people's power forward. forward. Down with the power down. down. So I am from Dominic from an organization called the Alternative Information and Development Center. Um, good morning to all the members of the audience and to the esteemed panel. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing team for pulling off this important People's Tribunal. Initiatives like these are important steps towards reclaiming people's power and our sovereignty. And so as AIDC, we appreciate and welcome the opportunity to present our findings. Secondly, it is pleasing to note that throughout the tribunal, linkages between public sector and private sector corruption was made. I will pick up on this in my input. Okay, there was supposed to be some slides, but I don't know what's <laughs> happening there. So out of the top 100 economies, 51 of big corporations, also known as transnational corporations, or TNCs, illustrating that around the world, power is shifting from countries to these big corporations or companies, and it is poor people who suffer. TNCs, or companies who are often legally based on one country, have their corporate management in a second, their financial assets in a third, and their administrative staff, staff spread over several more. They do this in order to create a world of smoke and mirrors, which is used to, used to hide the corrupt and illicit practices of these companies in their mission to consolidate <coughs> wealth and power. One of the ways that TNCs are concentrating their power is through profit shifting. Profit shifting is a form of illicit financial flows. I refer to profit shifting to, to, to demystify what is actually being done. Put simply, profit shifting refers to the strategies implemented by these big corporations to move money or capital from one country to another where they will have to pay very little or no corporate taxes. They do this using a bag of tricks, including transfer pricing, intercompany loans, and other charges and levies. I will speak to about more of this later. These corporations shift their capital to tax havens in order to evade paying decent wages and their fair share of taxes. This is part of their mission to maximize profits. One of the ways capital outflows takes place is through intercompany transactions. The Tax Justice Network estimated that intercompany transactions is between 60 and 70 percent of global sales. What this means is that trade or most trade is happening within the same corporation and not between different corporations. This is extremely shocking considering that most of these transactions have no economic substance, where substance refers to whether a service paid for is really provided 
or if its commercial value is inaccurately reported, exaggerated, or understated. So even though, even though profit shifting is a growing problem, it is not a new problem. The TNT is here. <laughs> Ashman et al. points out that the phenomenon of, phenomenon of capital outflows, profit shifting, has been coming along since before the ending of apartheid. However, the problem has gotten worse. They indicate that as a percentage of GDP, profit shifting increased from an average of 5.4% per annum between 1980 and 1993 to 9.2% between 1994 and 2000, and averaged 12% between 2001 and 2007, finally peaking at a staggering 20% in 2007. This graph over here just illustrates this is the total money South Africa collected in 2013 to tax revenues. This is the amount of money lost to illicit financial flows around the world in the same year. As you can see, this dwarfs the size of money South Africa is earning that year. So, so the just tell me what's the difference between the two? How much in South Africa and how much in the world? So in South Africa, Uh, billion dollars? No? We, 100, 813 billion rand we collected in 2013. In comparison, close to 60,000 billion dollars was lost to illicit financial flows in Asia. Okay, thank you. So the volume of profit shifting is enormous and is, and is increasing exponentially. In 2013, it was estimated that 1.1 trillion dollars was shifted illegally out of developing nations. In the same year, these developing nations received just $100 billion in official development assistance, a form of trade, meaning that for every $1 that comes into developing countries in aid, $10 gets siphoned out illegally. Next slide, please. The extent of profit shifting. So, next slide, please. In South Africa, illicit capital flows are substantial with, with the South African mining sector chiefly responsible for shifting profits out of the country to tax havens. The 2013 Global Financial Integrity Report placed South Africa 11th out of 15 developing countries with the highest volume of illicit capital flight. Since then, South Africa has made the largest jump from 7th to 10th spot, surpassing Nigeria to become the largest international financial flow source country on the African continent. This here just gives a sense of illicit financial flows leaving South Africa from 2004 to 2013. And as you can see, it varies, but that it, it, it's quite uh, substantial, close to $200 billion on average per year. So South Africa also has a vi very high illicit financial flows to GDP ratio. To get the sense of the scale of this, when profit shifting reached its peak in 2012, Illicit financial flows to, in, to GDP in South Africa was close to 10% of the GDP leaving the country. Profit shifting experts, Cars and Spaniards, argue that the very high ratio of illicit financial flows to GDP is extremely debilitating for a country's economy and its ability to redistribute wealth. This is corruption. How it is done? Firstly, it is important to recognize that profit shifting begins nationally, at home, before it advances to becoming an international problem. Through our research at AIDC, one of the lessons that has become sorry, one of the lessons that has become increasingly apparent is the extent to which subsidiaries are used as a vehicle for profit shifting. It is the subsidiaries, generally the producers, employers, and taxpayers in the country, or in South Africa in this case, who are responsible for transferring significant amounts of money or capital in management fees and similar payments to fellow entities before shifting out to South Africa. So how does this work? So, so this is a very simplified uh, organogram that I did for today. So here you see there's a mother company based in the United Kingdom, okay? We will just call it mother company for now. They open up other companies in South Africa, for example. One company called Subsidiary One who is going to mine, and we're going to look at platinum now. They're mining platinum. Then they open up a second subsidiary, a big mother company in South Africa. This is a management firm, 
and then they open up a third one in Bermuda, and this one over here is a marketing and sales company. Next slide, please, Naroli. Okay, so what happens is this. Subsidiary one, who's Western Platinum Limited, but forget the name for now, they mine platinum in South Africa. All the platinum that they mine, they sell off to this company here, who's a management company. The management company gets paid to sell the goods um, for the platinum company and they pay their management fees. By doing this, they reduce this company's profits because they're increasing the costs. And so this company pays less, less corporate tax in South Africa. This company is often the one with the most people who work there, the, all the, doing all the hard work. Okay. Then another transaction happens, two now. This company here sends the management fees to the big mother company in the UK where they pay no taxes. They do similarly to this one here in Bermuda where they also pay no taxes. So, next one please. So, this, was, this is actually how it looks in reality. And this is how Lonman PLC, the mother company, has organized some of its transfers historically. The South African part of the head office receives management fee fees from the subsidiary and in turn pays management fees to the UK part in the head office. Every year, management or sales fees payments have comprised of nearly 5% of subsidiary one's sales revenue since 2006. So, London Management Service, the second subsidiary, as I said, also pays uh, management fees to the mother body, the value of which is 429 million rand between 2007 and 2012. This is approximately 20 to 30 percent, depending on the year, share of subsidiary two's total income. This is completely unreasonable. And as I mentioned, London PLC has paid no tax in the United Kingdom, Kingdom from the year 2000 to the year 2013. How we figured this out. And by the way, um, it's very difficult to update this report that I'm giving you today. We did this about three years ago. The problem is that we were able to get the financial statements of Lonman after the Fallen Commission, after the Marikana massacre, right? Where they said that they couldn't build houses and they couldn't pay workers enough wages because they didn't have money, okay? So the Fallen Commission ordered the company to produce their financial statements. And as a result, we were able to figure this out. Today, it's hard to get anything out of them. So, how these mechanisms work? So, transfer pricing is the manipulation of trades in goods and services in order to declare less profits in the country with a higher corporate tax. The primary tool for transfer pricing is trade misinvoicing. According to GFI, Global Financial Integrity Report, 83.4% of illicit financial flows is attributable to trade misinvoicing, amounting to an average of 654.7 billion US dollars every year. This is done with services rendered, especially because it's harder to dispute the substance of the services. So they also charge levies, licensing, and royalty fees and patents. So exaggerated charges levied on local mines and the extraction of fees by the main South African company, Total Coal South Africa PTY Limited. So they have smaller subsidiary companies as well, who we call junior miners. Now junior miners are obliged to sell the entire production to Total Coal South Africa. To facilitate this agreement, which is guaranteed by the way, Total Coal South Africa charges a 4% marketing fee on the joint venture with the junior miner. In other words, junior miners pay Total Coal South Africa 4% of their earnings per annum for the privilege of selling the entire production. This is the domestic dimension. Then a further 7% sales commission is levied on Total Coal South Africa by a UK-based subsidiary, completing the profit shifting process. The third way that they do this is through intercompany loans, or what we call thin capitalization. So profits can be moved from one subsidiary through payments on interest 
on a loan it received from other subsidiaries in the same corporation group. So it's companies from the big body that's all together, they give loans to each other. And what they do is they charge a very high interest rates to the company so that they have more money to pay to the, the same company that's theirs, but in a different country where there's no taxes. Okay? So they use these intercompany loans to book the interest on the loan as a deductible cost in the country where they produce and extract it and add it as a revenue in the tax-free or low-profit country. AIDC uncovered that such a scheme was organized by Eastern Platinum Limited, who used an intercompany loan from a subsidiary located on a tax haven called the Bahamas. Instead of using equity from investments by the mother company, as a result, the South African-based subsidiary registered a loss rather than a profit in 2010 and 2011. So what is the consequences? Now, the implications of this is that government has less capacity to fund public services because very few rich people, heading big corporations, are avoiding paying their fair share of taxes. taxes. But more significantly, and I would like to stress this, they evade paying workers decent wages, or what AIDC would call a living wage. So I say more significantly because unless the corporate tax rate is above 51%, the money that is shifted out of the country to the tax haven is completely removed from the collective bargaining table from which higher wages can be paid. Okay, so how this works is this. This is, an, this is an example of 100 million rand, okay? So you have a company who wants to move taxes of 100 million rand out of the country. So it moves 100 from South Africa, 100 million to Bermuda. In doing that, at a 28% corporate tax rate, they're actually taking away 72 million rand that can be going to wages, okay? Now, if you compare the 72 million rand from the 100 million rand example, then, of course, the profit shifting, the impact on profit shifting on wage levels is numerically much greater than that on the reduction of the tax base. <clears throat> now, can it be stopped? Okay, let me just go on to what must be done. So, AIDC in our submission to the Davis Tax Committee asserts that as long as the problem of profit shifting continues unabated will mean a grave threat to South African democracy and therefore we need to demand the following three things. One, an amendment to the Companies Act to say that all transnational corporations must publish annual financial statements publicly. And this, in here, we need to include the automatic exchange of financial information. Secondly, increased resources for the monitoring authority the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, the CIPC. Policymakers should require transnational corporations and unless strong labor organizations and trade unions don't take up the struggle, then the, the balance of forces shifts even more in favor of transnational corporations and we're not able to put enough pressure on them to change this system of impunity, as you would like to call it. I don't know if that answers your yeah. question. Uh, thank you, Dominic. Thanks, Dominic. Um, so, this sounds to me like a very well organized syndicate of some kind. And I think my question is having heard testimonies over the past few days about how um, private sector and public sector corruption are kind of linked. Um, in your opinion, how complacent are states, whether at an international or local level in this whole thing? And I was going to ask you what are some of the mechanisms that can be used to, to prevent this, but I think you've spoken to that. Mm. And lastly, you mentioned the Falam Commission, and I was interested just if you could just speak a bit more to that, what that commission was about and what it sought to do. Thanks. Okay. So, the, the first question about the state, it follows on from uh, Comrade Dinga's question. And they are also missed one point that I'll add to it now, and that is also there's many politicians. We've seen from the Paradise Papers, from the Panama Papers, that there's many politicians who's, who's complicit in this corruption, okay? Even in Kosa Zaina, Tlamini Zuma is mentioned, and many others for that matter, but that, that's not the one thing. Um, in terms of uh, the Fallen Commission, 
Basically, after the Maracana massacre, um, a commission of inquiry and investigation was set up to find out what's going on. And why did this happen? Uh, the London mine workers went on strike because <coughs> they wanted a better wage. And um, the London, the, the company that we investigated, said they don't have this money. And so this commission inquiry was set up. You killed these people. For killing these people, you said you don't have the money to kill them. So let's check. Make your financial statements available. One of the things that Lonman said they would do was build 5,500 houses. Right? They only built three over a period of three to five years, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and, and they said they couldn't afford to build it. But when we saw their financial statements, we seen them moving millions and billions of money out of the country every single year. And so that's sort of the background in which we were able to develop this kind of the report. Well, this is excellent research on legal trade and illicit financial flows. There's a huge gray area about illicit trade, particularly illicit mining, right? Many people are mining platinum in the Limpopo illegally. So is that very difficult to track and keep an eye on? Just uh, for category, are you talking about Zama Zama, small scale miners? What are you talking about? Because from our perspective, these big mining companies are also doing illegal practices, mm -hmm. okay? And then in terms of your question about illicit and illicit, the gray area, we feel that any, look, there's some people who are saying that some of these things are legal. Because of the legal system behind it, companies can do these things okay. The problem is that it's killing poor people. It's killing us, right? So whether they want to call it legal or illegal, I don't care. We must call it illegal because of what it's doing to our people. So we need to change those laws so that it reflects our interests and not the interests of those very, very rich, who's very, very rich at our expense. I think. I think. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I have no questions. Congratulations. You have made uh, something very complex into, uh, into a kind of simple proposition which even I can understand. The, the, the trouble is that apart from explaining to us how it happens, you've also taught us how to do it. And I hope none of us get involved in this thing. And finally, I must say that if I were the president of this country, which I'll never be, I would appoint you as chair of a commission of inquiry into illicit cash flows. Thank you very much.